so welcome to our B13 training this afternoon. Uh, we will be talking about developing those compliant transition plans. And here is our team. Um, Colette Sullivan is our federal programs coordinator. She is busy doing other things, so she's not able to be with us today. But my name is Carly Thibodeau, and I am one of the members of the team. And I've been a part of the team for almost two years now. And before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. And with me today are our Jennifer. Good afternoon. I am Jennifer Gleason. And like Carly, I was a special education teacher before I joined the team uh, three years ago. And Ashley? Hi, everybody. I'm Ashley Satry, and I have been on the team for just shy of a year. Before that, I was a teacher, a special ed teacher in Virginia and here in Maine for 14 years. Excellent. And Julie? Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I have been with the DOE. This is my seventh year. And prior to that, I was um, at a K-5 to elementary school for 16 years. Awesome. Thank you very much. So we are going to, we just did quick introductions um, and we're going to talk about what is B13. Um, I know that was a question I had when I joined this team. I had never heard of that phrase before. Um, and then we're going to go through those specific things for B13. Uh, we'll take a look at, at a case study checklist, go over some FAQs and resources. So we'll get started. Uh, first things first, uh, as you may know, IDEA eligibility has been extended to age 22 per um, the update to MUSER, the Maine Unified Special Ed Regulations. That was passed through LD 98 um, as of October 25th, 2023. So what is this B13 that we just throw around and expect everybody to know what it is? <laughs> it's one of the um, 17 federal indicators. There are 17 total indicators and B13 is the 13th indicator. And these are the indicators that we are required to report on as part of the federal monitoring team. We report to the federal Department of Education or like the Office of Special Ed Programming, OSEP, as we call them. Um, and I think we'll get some more information as we come up. This is a link that'll take you to those 17 indicators if you're interested in any of the others. Um, so Carly, soon to be 18. <laughs> soon to be 18, yes. That's the caps closed within a year. Is that what the 18th one is going to be? Yes. So if you wonder why we're after people to close their corrective action plans so fiercely, that's because we know that that indicator is coming. And so we're just trying to prepare ourselves to get ready for that. Um, so indicators are measures of compliance and effectiveness of the state's implementation of IDEA. And so when we look at B13, we're looking at the 16 plus. We get that question a lot when we're on site because in Maine, according to Muser, it's ninth grade. It starts in ninth grade when you have to have transition plans. Um, but with IDEA, it's 16 or older. So we follow the IDEA for that and report that data to them. Um, so again, we report all of that B13 or that transition. It's all about the transition plan and transition goals, that whole piece of that IEP. We report that straight to OSEP, the Office of Special Ed Programs. Um, and the, the big thing with most or all of these indicators, I'm pretty sure if I've looked at them, is that they require or expect that it's 100%. So if something, one piece of the transition plan is non-compliant, the whole plan is considered 0%. We don't get any credit for one, you know, like nine out of the 10 pieces being correct. 90% is not good enough. It has to be 100. So it's a little frustrating on our end, but. Um, so today we're going to talk a lot about compliance, but um, we also keep in mind that programming piece. We don't want to leave that out because we know that's a huge piece, especially for those students that are, you know, receiving those transition plans and talking about the transition plans and getting ready for that post-secondary life. 
Um, so it's really about promoting those ambitious youths. I mean, ambitious outcomes for youth. Sorry about that. Um, you know, we always want to be talking to students about what they want to do after high school. What's going to happen after high school? So, and that's why we keep in this information and just kind of have you think about meaningful day. Um, so meaningful day means individualized access for persons with developmental disabilities to support their participation in activities and functions of community life that are desired and chosen by the general population. So just some things to keep in mind, like when you're thinking about meaningful day, you know, how can these people be active community members? How can these students be active community members? Um, you know, really thinking about what is purposeful for them, not for us necessarily, but for them, what would be purpose, purposeful and meaningful to them? Um, and really thinking about how to get them engaged in the community and um, feeling like that they're active members of the community and really just making it as meaningful as possible for the student. So again, just all people in their families have the right to live, work, play, live, love, work, play, and pursue their life aspirations in their community. So really thinking about how they can become members of that community. And then, uh, you know, thinking about what's important for you or them as a student, you know, per being able to pursue passions, discover life's purpose, be self-aware, focus, um, spend money on people more than things. So just thinking about that for yourself, but also trying to pass that on to them and get them to think about that with their lives and all of these things listed here. So if you're willing, tell us in the chat box something that makes life meaningful to you. What makes it a meaningful day? <laughs> always right Jennifer replied doggo so you know we some of us have animal families that's very good it's very meaningful I'm going to drop the links in here again gardening friends children and of course our job right spending time family and friends absolutely being helpful grandkids pets aka family absolutely those are great, meaningful day things. Thank you so much for sharing, everybody, being in nature. Absolutely. So just keep in mind, everybody deserves that opportunity to live a life that is meaningful to them. And so as you're working with students and they're getting into high school and 16 plus, it's really about thinking, you know, about that transition plan, helping them plan for that post-secondary and thinking what is going to be meaningful for them as they move on. Um, and so when you're thinking about this, you know, what is it that you're actually doing to support the student as they think about their transition? What assessments are you using? How are you going to apply those results of those assessments to help them move on into their post-secondary? And then what is going to be meaningful for them? And what are, you know, you all doing as a staff to really help the student achieve those goals and live that meaningful day or meaningful life. All right, any questions before we jump into the meat of the compliance piece? Because over the time we've really whittled this training down to be very specific on compliance. So we don't have a lot of the programming pieces that I think that we're in here in the past. Do you recommend an assessment to use? We do have a slide on here that will give you a link to those assessments. So we will definitely have that available as we get to that slide, definitely. I don't know if someone's able to throw that in the chat, but while I talk, I can do that. I think Jennifer's gonna do it, thank you. So um, here we go. So the first part is before you even get to the transition plan, um, it, which is the very last part of the IEP when we're thinking in part, you know, of the IEP going through in sections, you have that section three where there's this 3J is where you check off 
is the child in ninth grade or above, or is the child 16 years old or older? And if, the, if they are, then you have to check yes here and create a transition plan. So that's where you should be thinking about this. Now, I will be honest, I did not write transition plans because I was not at that level when I was teaching. Um, however, what I've heard people say is that the transition plan really is the first thing that you should be thinking about when you're creating the IEP, because you're talking to the student about their goals and what they want to do post-secondary. And so that really should be the driver for the rest of the IEP. And here is that transition plan. And like I said, that's the very last piece. So it's really hard to think about, oh, we should do that first because it's at the end. Um, but this is section nine, when you're thinking about our main IEP. Um, and then again, just that note that MUSER, the main unified special ed regulation says that they need to have a transition pl plan in place no later than ninth grade, but IDEA doesn't require it until age 16. So just keep that in mind. Um, and this is, Again, it should be a post second uh, transition plan should be for children with a disability beginning during their ninth grade year, since this is Maine. However, um, it, there's been discussion about really transition plans should be discussed earlier than that. You know, even in the elementary grades, which I that was my level that I taught, and it's kind of crazy to think about, but I I guess it is a good topic just to kind of always keep in the back of their mind. What do you want to do later on? You know, and just have them thinking about post secondary, even from that very early age. <clears throat> so the transition plan is really about showing movement. So a lot of times you'll hear us say, you know, keep things in there that you've already done so that we can see what they did, you know, like their freshman year or their beginning of high school, you know, and even if they're towards their end of high school, or for example, with those courses of study, it's required to start when they enter high school to their anticipated exit. So you're really thinking about showing that movement. And that can change from year to year as the plan is updated, but it really is about showing movement throughout those years. Okay, so here we go um, with the first part. We look at the advanced written notice for the first couple of findings when we look at transition plans. So these are the things that we look at on the advanced written notice. We look to make sure that the post-secondary goals and transition services are checked off here. So that should at least be done annually but it really needs to be checked off any time you're going to discuss post-secondary goals and transition services. But if you're just having a meeting about something that isn't gonna reflect on the um, transition plan, then you wouldn't have to check this, um, but it should be done annually. And then also remembering to invite the child. So you want to make sure that you're inviting them best practice is to include them in this salutation. You can see here, dear Mr. and Mrs. Doe and Johnny. So this child is invited right there. However, if, and we've heard this from some people, the vendors don't always let you um, edit that. So the student may not be able to be populated there, but you definitely wanna add them as an invited person on the bottom half or the second page of the advanced written notice where you put in the student in their name. All right, and then this part is 9G in the parental consent form. This is where if there's an agency invited, um, so if there's an agency responsible to provide and or pay for services, you would list them in 9G. However, it's related to this, uh, this piece that we look at that's also part of the advanced written notice, which is kind of confusing. So that's why it feels like we're going out of order, but you would need to get parental consent to invite that agency to the IEP meeting. And you need to get the consent before you send out the advanced written notice. So this is the consent form. And to um, show that you 
are attempting to invite them or get consent to invite that outside agency, you can use this form and show that you've given or mailed this to the parent. And it will either show that you received it back from the parent or if you didn't receive it back, and that's why you did not invite the parent, uh, the agency, then you would have this in there as well. Because this is a bit of change in practice. When we looked at IDEA, we realized that it's really about the public agency must invite the representative of any participating agency that is likely to be responsible for providing or paying for transition services. So if you are saying that, yes, there is someone and you're putting them in 9G, we would expect to see that you are inviting them. But to invite them, you need to have this consent form. So. I think I covered everything. Jennifer, if I missed something on that, feel free to jump in. <clears throat> um, so again, this needs this consent. If there's an outside agency involved and you need to get this consent form because you're going to be inviting them, then you need to do it before you send out the advanced written notice inviting that outside agency. And the consent needs to be signed for every meeting where transition planning is discussed. So if the advanced written notice is checked off that you're talking about the post-secondary, then you would need to invite that outside agency. And every time you want to do that, you need to get the consent signed. Now, we do understand that parents are able to bring or invite whoever they want to IEP meetings. Um, and obviously they may just show up and be like, yes, this agency is involved in my, my child, you know, and so you just want to document that very clearly on the written notice because you may not have known that they were involved. Um, however, um, you, they came to the meeting. And so now that you know that they're involved, the next time you would be responsible as the SAU to invite them to the meeting and get that parental consent ahead of time. But if you didn't know and the parent brought them, just document that on the written notice saying that, you know, the parents brought them and just also document somewhere in the written notice that, you know, you didn't know that they were involved. So the parent invited them, but, you know, now you will be inviting them going forward or something like that, just to kind of clear that up so that there's an understanding of why that consent isn't there and why the parents brought them versus the SAU inviting them. Okay. And then, Carly, can I ask you a question? Yes. So um, if we if we have a, uh, a consent form, not the one that you showed, but a consent form that says we are able to share information and, and on that consent form it says, you know, to invite that participant each time, do we still need to have that form signed every single time? I believe so. Jennifer, do you know the answer to that? Because this isn't like a yeah. relief that you can do once it a year. Must it must be for before every meeting and before the advance written notice for every meeting. And that's in part of IDEA. So, okay, I got to process this. <laughs> um, so if, if we put check the box for post-secondary and because we talk about post-secondary almost at every meeting, right? Because that's a big piece of what we try to do. Is, is just prepare kids for the next level, right? So if I check the box for post-secondary and there's another agency, but they're not relevant to that post-secondary conversation, I don't need to invite them. I only need to invite them if they're relevant to that particular discussion. Is that accurate? It, it, if there's a meeting where you are discussing post-secondary transition, you must invite them. Okay, and that form needs to be signed every single time. Is that form new? Nope, it's not new, but our understanding of the must invite thing is new. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. But really you only have to, under the law, you only have to discuss post-secondary transition once per year. So you don't I, necessarily yeah, I have that. to we, check that yeah. box for every meeting. Just yep. Saying. No, no I, that's going to be a new. Thank you. I appreciate that information. Okay. All right. Great. So the next 
piece of the transition plan that we look at, we look for in the written notice. And this is just a statement around that post-secondary goals were updated. And so along with that little checkbox being marked that was from before, but now we look for a statement within the written notice saying just that the team reviewed and updated transition goals or that the transition plan was discussed and updated, something to that effect, just noting in the written notice that the transition plan was discussed, talked about, updated. And then here, um, 9A, you just wanna make sure that you're putting the projected date of graduation for the student. You wanna document that with the month and the year. Um, and if they are credit deficient, that date can change because as we talked about, this transition plan is about showing movement. So if things change, you just wanna update it when you're updating that transition plan that one time per year at the annual. And um, if you're thinking about a student that will be staying beyond the four years, um, you wanna think about planning for that as early as possible. So as a freshman, if you know that they may be staying for uh, the fifth year or the sixth year or however that works for their age, then you would want to start that planning and show that on their transition plan as early as possible and document in the written notice, of course, because our favorite phrase is, if it's not in the written notice, it didn't happen. Okay, and I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer, if you're good with that. All right, all good. All right, um, we need to look to see that the post-secondary goals must be based on age-appropriate uh, assessments, and Carly talked a little bit about that. Um, those get listed in section 9B. Um, we recommend keeping the old ones in there and just putting the year just again to show that movement. You know, if we go in and we're looking at a senior and all they have is an informal student interview from their freshman year, we're going to ask questions about that. And, you know, why, why, why is that? Um, acceptable. Transition assessments, you can use SATs, PSATs, that kind of thing, AccuPlacer, but um, you cannot, NWEAs, you know, those uh, um, eligibility evaluations, those are not transition assessments. They don't have a transition component. You can, you don't have to, but you can put a summary of your transition assessments in section 4A where the evaluations go. Um, it's really nice to have that in there, um, but you don't have to. And this is just an example of what that might look like. This is the link to the new transition main webpage. Um, I just, got in there a few minutes ago and I was having trouble getting in, but I did finally get in. So I don't know what's going on with the website right now, but it should be good. Um, 9C is whether the student attended or not. Um, and if they did not, you want to, um, if, if they don't plan on attending, you probably wanna meet with them um, before the meeting to get their ideas about their post-secondary goals so that you can share them with the team. And then the important part, the post-secondary goals. So they are broken up into education training, employment, and independent living. You want to tie the education and employment goals together. Right, you, you don't wanna say we'll go to school for welding and wants to be employed as a gardener. You don't wanna, you know, make sure that they are related to each other. Um, the independent living goal can actually be blank. It's like one of the very few places in the IEP that can actually be blank. Um, but think about that. Think about even kids, you know, who are going to go to college, you know, maybe they need some independent living skills if they're going to college and they're going to live in a dorm or 
share an apartment? You know, what did, do they know how to clean? Do they know how to budget? Um, do they know how to pay bills? Do they know how to access support services at their college? That kind of thing. So it, it that's not necessarily just for those lower functioning students, the independent living. All right, so here is an example. The student wants to attend a four-year college or university to study marketing. And you can see it's tied to the employment goal. They want to work in the field of marketing. They will live independently and access mental health supports with support from his parents. So this is a lot. What if the child wants to be a professional video gamer or YouTuber or TikToker, right? You're not going to, you know, laugh at them and say, yeah, ha ha. You're not going to, you know, say, oh, you can't do that or, you know. You're going to investigate that with them. Well, what kind of, um, what kind of skills do you need to do that? What, um, what does it pay? You know, how do you apply? Whatever. Um, and also find jobs that are kind of related to that, but not necessarily that, you know what I mean? So, um, just really dig in and research with the student and they might decide that maybe that's not what they wanted after all. Your transition goals, there must be at least one annual goal in section five of the IP that addresses post-secondary goals. Really, they all should. I mean, if you think about it, what you're doing all through high school is preparing the students for post-secondary transition. So um, I would think that they all kind of bring the child there. Um, please do not create standalone transition goals. They're awkward. They're not measurable. Um, the goals that are already there definitely will lead to transition. Um, you can have you can match them up per goal, per post-secondary goal. You can have one goal that actually addresses all of their post-secondary goals, however you do it. Um, you just need to make sure that there are goals in the IEP that will help the student move toward their post-secondary goals, all of their post-secondary goals. So this is just an example of the student had um, a writing goal, right? A lot of students have academic goals. The student wants to go to college for marketing. They're going to have to be able to write. So the um, writing goal is a good one to tie in. And also, this one would match with pretty much anything. Um, using the techniques learned on, learned during social work to manage anxiety, right? Everybody's going to need that kind of thing. Um, or for any job that he wants, he's going to need that. So that those existing IEP goals should easily tie into post-secondary goals. Course of study. So this, um, to be compliant, you have to have current year through exit. We recommend keeping past years on there too. Again, to show that movement. And you can see in the um, in the little prompt there, I don't know if you could see because it's tiny, but it says they need to be directly linked to the post-secondary goals. So the student has intro to marketing, they have carpentry, you know, choose electives or maybe if you have access to a um, to CTE or something, a VOC program, um, make sure that's in there. Um, don't just put electives, put the specific electives. Um, they can change every year. You're going to update the IEP and transition plan every year anyway. Um, so as the student changes their mind, change those electives and classes to kind of flow with them. Um, but it needs to be just make sure that those courses are tied to those post-secondary goals.
Um, oh, of course, I've said this is all the stuff I just said. <laughs> Multi year through the end. Um, make it current. Okay to amend it. Yeah, don't just put things like child will complete graduation requirements or electives. And transition services. Um, so think of this, I think of this as section seven of the IEP, services that are going to, right, the services that help the child achieve their IEP goals. These are the services that are going to help the child get to their post-secondary goals. We recommend a nice bulleted list, right? You can put the services they're getting in school, um, career services, community, um, any daily living, you know, you could put anything in there. You could put things that, you know, the parents are helping them do. This one, primary caregiver for the family dog is in there. You know, those are all important things to get towards independence. Um, so you want to put the services and activities in there that occur during the life of the IEP. Um, you can keep the previous ones in there, put the year in parentheses, um, but don't, you're not putting future ones in here. You're, you're putting, it's very confusing. So the course of study is current to future and, um, Transition activities and services are past and current, not future. So they just like to make it more confusing for us. I think. Age of majority. Um, in the year that the child will turn 17, you have to inform them um, of their rights when they turn 18. So make sure you fill that out and Leave that date there for the rest of the IEP forever. So just some things to think about. Um, transition plans like IEPs should be student-centered, right? It is, is there what they um, want to do based on their transition assessments. Um, family engagement is really important, especially with a lot of those um, services and activities, right? The families have to buy in. Um, assessments. Assessments are everything. Assessments are going to really help the student kind of think about what they want to do, but it's also might move them away from some things. Um, job shadowing will also do that kind of thing. You want to make sure you're kind of moving them in the direction that they really want, right? You don't want them to go out and go to school for something and then decide they hate it. Um, students must be invited, um, and again, outside agencies must be part of the team. We have a link here. These, this is for, um, this training will be there, but also um, trainings that Titus and Leora do that is more um, tied to those assessments and programming things. We do compliance and they do the fun stuff um of that programming so they do a um power hour every i think tuesday to talk about all things transition again this is the transition main website that's pretty new any questions from here I don't see any, but I'm going to go to the next little section, but throw your questions in the chat if you want. So we have a couple checklists here. This is just ours, kind of what we look at. Um, but there are checklists. Um, there are federal. There's a little tiny link at the bottom there that you can get to these forms that have been put out by um, federal. Um, technical assistance agencies. And this is where um, we kind of got what we look at from these checklists mostly, um, because this is like the, the federal technical assistance agencies are 
paid by OSEP to kind of help the states. OSEP is the Office of Special Education Programs. So this is what we need to look at. And this is them telling us this is what we need to look at. So you can access these. They are online. Um, and it kind of will explain why we look at we look why we look at what we look at. All right, let's do a little case study. This is Bill. Bill's 19. He's in a self-contained setting. He receives SDI with an alternate curriculum. He gets all the related services. He's fed with a G-tube. He has a trach and uses a ventilator with oxygen to breathe. Um, so Bill, Bill's education goal is that he will participate in an in-home or center-based program designed to provide habilitative and vocational training with medical and therapeutic supports because he's going to need those. He will participate in on-the-job stretch training using micro switches. So employment, he will participate in tech technologically supported or volunteer workplace with supported jobs at development services through voc rehab. And he will live at home and participate to the maximum, maximum extent possible in his daily routines and environment using technology. Now this is this is our case study because we do get a lot of questions about what, you know, what if what if this student can't work or what if, you know, if they're really low functioning, what do we do? So this is our case study. Everybody can do something. It goes back to that um, meaningful day. So these are Bill's strengths. He's curious. He stays alert and awake throughout the day. He enjoys attention. He tolerates position changes and he likes using a switch with assistance to activate a variety of devices. So that's where that, um, that education and employment came from, that he can use a switch to activate something to do a job. Um, these are his gaps, right? He, communication gaps, um, one button communication device, limited fine motor, um, and these are his goals. Uh, he'll use his device to communicate yes to indicate desire for an item in preparation for education, employment, and independent living. So his he has his post-secondary goals and he has his IP goals that feed those post-secondary goals. We have a bunch of frequently asked questions. Um, I don't know how many there are here, but I can go through them quick. Um, so a new ninth grader with an annual in September, you don't have to write it right away. Um, the transition plan needs to be done by the end of ninth grade. So if, they if their annual is in September, Maybe you can not do the transition plan then. Maybe you can schedule another meeting in the um, winter or the spring after you've had time to do some um, transition assessments. What assessment? Oh, no, I'm a good question. Did we say that in here? There are some. I know because I I only graduated one student. I think I wrote two <laughs> transition plans, but these are the kids that I taught. They didn't put that in, but that's really good. We're going to have to add that. And that is a very good question um, for Leora and Titus. I think Leora especially is all about the transition assessments. I'm going to pop right in there right now because I'm in the assessment. Oh, right here. If you go to that website, there is a drop down for assessments with for students with significant disabilities. So it's there on the website. Good question. 
Um, what if the child wants to be a rock star? We talked about that. Don't discourage them, but help them to learn about it. Um, oh, this is something we didn't talk about. Don't put specific colleges or businesses, it's, you know, like student will work at this business or student will attend this college um, because they might not get in or they might not get a job there. I think the only time you would do that is um, if it's a family business and you know that they're going to work there. Can we include parents? Yes. Um, parents can absolutely help and should be involved. What do we do if the parents don't want to encourage the child to seek employment? We've actually, I heard this recently, actually. Um, I think I would share um, some of the assessments and things with them. Share the website with them. Maybe send them to the Maine Parent Federation, get some advice. Meaningful day. Talk about the meaningful day. That's a good one. All right. Any last questions? And if you think of any later, we're always here. Resources we have. Um, eligibility to 22. This is um, Titus and Leora's contact information. The power hours, they are every Tuesday, I think at three o'clock. Um, they are both extremely knowledgeable in all things transition. So they are really good resources if um, you need information about programming or assessments. This is another really good, you can sign up for um, the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition. They added something to the end of that, the collaborative and TACTC is what they're called. You can um, join for free and um, go through their website. They have really cool um, things on there too. Wisconsin has really good self-advocacy resources. Indicator 13 toolkit. This is this from, who is this from? Project 10. Um, this is another um, national technical assistance provider. This is from Project 10 as well. So, you know, all kinds of stuff out there. Probably if you Google post-secondary transition, you'll get a lot of them. Um, our procedural manual, this link will get you there. And there is a section on transition plans. User is always a good resource, although it's hard to read. Our IEP quick reference document is invaluable. It will help you with all the different sections of the IEP to be compliant. And this first link is to our professional development calendar. And the second one is to all of our um, recordings. We record every training. And then we have links to fun things like law and forms and data. These are our past office hours and professional development. So some of these links will bring you to recordings and we're almost at the end. We have a few more left. So you could sign up at those last few links there. And then we will, hopefully over the summer, we will um, put out our new schedule for 24-25. And there's only one of these left next week, consultation and related service goals next Wednesday at three o'clock. Have your related service providers come join us for the fun. And this is a link for a little feedback form. We use the feedback. We, um, we have changed our PD, how we do it. And we're always looking for topics that you're interested in because we want to make it meaningful. Um, and if you answer just a few questions and put in your email, You'll get a contact hour for being here today.
DOE connection links. And there we are. You can reach out to any of us with questions about um, compliance anytime. We are here for you. Anything else, Carly? No, nope, right. I think you covered everything. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you next time.